welcome to this edition of the Virtual Space TV Show. I'm Amanda Bush, your host. This time we have prepared the following stories for you. SpaceX Dragon, a mission update. Shuttle's discovery and Enterprise retire in style. Does your wife demand unique jewels? Call us, 800 Space Jewels. Asteroid mining hits the headlines. Citizen scientists search for asteroids and map the moon. And finally, let's hear what James has to say about the recent space weather. Last month we reported on the planned launch in April of the SpaceX Dragon spacecraft to the International Space Station. Unfortunately, the mission has been postponed several times since then and is now scheduled for May 19. The problem has been with ensuring the integrity of the software that controls the Dragon, which must rendezvous near the station and then slowly approach the giant structure without ramming into it. SpaceX and NASA have been doing extended simulations of the software with innumerable variations of parameters and random component failures. These simulations have taken far longer to complete and analyze than expected. In the meantime, SpaceX did carry out a successful two-second test firing of the engines with the rocket attached securely to the pad. The window for the launch is very narrow, it's a so-called instantaneous launch window, that is. Any abort will mean a delay of at least three days before the next attempt. Because of the busy schedule of spacecraft traffic and crew changes at the station, there will only be a few more open dates in May and June for the Dragon to launch. If the Dragon does not fly by June, it may need to wait till September for an open launch date. Since the last space shuttle flight last July, the orbiters have been undergoing refurbishment to prepare them for moving to the museums where they will retire. For example, thruster systems that used toxic fuels had to be carefully cleaned. Also, the huge main engines were removed so they could be used in a few years on the first stage booster of NASA's planned space launch system. On April 19, the Discovery Orbiter was flown piggyback on the Boeing 747 from Cape Canaveral to Dulles Airport in Virginia. Before landing, the pair made several passes over Washington, D.C. to the delight of onlookers. Discovery was rolled to the nearby extension of the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum where it took the place of the Enterprise shuttle. Enterprise never went to space but it did make short flights during the 1970s when it was dropped from a 747 to test the glide and landing capabilities of the shuttle design. On April 27, Enterprise flew on the same 747 from Dulles to New York City where it will reside at the Intrepid Museum. The pair made for some spectacular photos as they flew over the Big Apple. On April 24, the company Planetary Resources made its debut at the Museum of Flight in Seattle, Washington. Backed by several famous moguls such as James Cameron and Google co-founder Larry Page, the company laid out a long-term plan to mine asteroids for water and precious metals such as platinum. The business leaders of the company are Peter Diamandis and Eric Anderson. Diamandis has been involved with many innovative projects such as the X Prize and the International Space University. Anderson was co-founder of Space Adventures, which has arranged for flights of private individuals to the International Space Station. In fact, one of the billionaires backing planetary resources, Charles C. Moni, flew twice to the station with the help of Anderson's company. Chris Lewicki is the technical chief of the project. 
He has been a top manager of NASA's Mars Lander and Rover projects. His plan is to begin with a set of small, low-cost spacecraft that will be put into Earth orbit with telescopes to survey the inner solar system for asteroids that pass near the Earth. There are about 9,000 of these so-called near-Earth objects, or NEOs, currently identified but there are believed to be as many as a million. A second generation of spacecraft with propulsion systems will go to the most promising NEOs to survey them up close. Subsequent generations of spacecraft will do extensive assays of these objects, culminating in actual extraction and processing of materials. There is also the possibility of moving a modest-sized asteroid into orbit around the Moon. There it could be more easily accessed and mined. Water from asteroids could be broken into hydrogen and oxygen using solar power and then used as fuel for space vehicles to travel to Mars and other places in the solar system. Platinum, which sells for about $50,000 per kilogram, could perhaps be returned to Earth for a profit if a low-cost return and re-entry system is developed. It will take planetary resources many years to prove that asteroid mining is feasible technically and economically. However, the team is very impressive and it can be said that they have already helped to greatly reduce the giggle factor for space mining. Private companies are not the only ones interested in asteroids. NASA recently invited amateur astronomers to join a program to search for near-Earth objects. NASA is sending a spacecraft called OSIRIS-REx to travel to NEO and it will return with a sample of its surface material. NASA wants to compare this asteroid with other NEOs and so hopes that the amateurs will find lots more than are currently known. Amateurs have long made important contributions to science. In fact, most basic science was carried out by non-professionals up till the start of the 20th century. Even today, in areas like astronomy, amateurs often make important discoveries. Recently, there have been several initiatives to bring a broad range of the public and to assist with real scientific projects. These projects typically take advantage of the tremendous human ability to spot novel patterns in complex visual scenes. An example of this sort of citizen science program is the new Moon Mappers project. NASA's Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter camera has taken thousands of images of the lunar surface, which is covered with craters from innumerable asteroid impacts over the ages. Public participants are invited to analyze such images and to identify and characterize craters that they see. Such data will greatly help scientists understand the history of the Moon. Now let's turn to James C. Burke to hear what's been happening in solar weather. Thanks, Amanda. Since 2009, the Sun has been on the uphill side of the next peak in the solar cycle. The solar cycle refers to the regular variation in the number of sunspots and in the solar activity that rises and falls in synchrony with those sunspots. During the peak periods of the solar cycle, there are frequent solar eruptions that can send huge waves of particles that sweep over the Earth. These result in beautiful aurora, as we have seen in previous shows, and also in damaged satellites and even overloaded electrical systems on Earth. The current cycle has been much smaller than expected. It appears the peak in the number of sunspots will be the lowest in 100 years. The dynamics of the tremendously complex sun are far from completely understood and such behavior will provide more data to help understand it. It's possible also that the solar cycle may affect the Earth's climate but this is a very controversial topic. It will be very interesting to see whether the sun remains in a low-key state in the next cycle or comes roaring back. So keep your eye on our nearest star, but, of course, only with your coolest shades on. Also in the name of Amanda, I say goodbye to you now and hope that you will join us again in June. In the meantime get the latest news at www.hobbyspace.com, and in particular, don't miss the upcoming SpaceX demonstration flight. You can contact Amanda at amanda.bush at binary-space.com for any comments or suggestions. Stay tuned.